Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracts, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracts Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracts and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world, and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the broadcast. It's the Friday broadcast. What a great day. The weekend is coming. At least for most of us, you'll have the weekend off. My mind and heart are already beginning to focus on the fact that I get to open God's word and declare God's truth to both saved people and lost people this coming Sunday. I get to teach Sunday school. I get to preach in a morning and evening service. I love the teaching of the Word of God. I love to openly declare God's Word is true and apply passages to the people who know Christ and then apply the gospel truth to those who need Christ as Savior. I get excited about the weekend, and I hope you are excited about being in your own local Bible preaching preaching church this coming Lord's Day. I hope your heart and mine are prepared to receive all that God has for us on this coming Lord's Day. Well, right now my Bible is open to 2 Peter chapter 3. We are doing a verse-by-verse walk through this book. We're in the third chapter, the final chapter. Our focus today will be verse number 5. We'll read verses 3, 4, and 5 to lead into our study. I've got a gospel tract in my hand right now. Do you know what a gospel tract is. A gospel tract, that's our main focus of ministry here, but a gospel tract is a short, written presentation of God's plan of salvation, a plan open to any and all that they might be saved from their sin, receive the gift of eternal life, all because God loves you. God sent his son to do for you and me what we could not, cannot, could never do for ourselves, which is pay our sin debt and remove the sin stain off of our soul. Well, I'm going to come back to 2 Peter 3 in a moment. Let me lead into the Bible study this way. One of the growing societal trends that you have seen, I have seen in recent years, has to do with the idea that nobody takes responsibilities for their mistakes anymore. When I was a high school student, there was this guy that was in a lot of my classes, but he never turned in his reports. His excuse was always that, well, I didn't know uh, when it was due. I didn't know I didn't know. It's funny. The rest of the class all knew the date when the report was due, but that was his excuse. He didn't know. I once hired a person to work for us who never owned up to their mistakes, even when they were the only person that could have done it. Now, I don't mind mistakes, but just own up to them. And when you don't, it frustrates me to no end. Do you know that in every era of human existence, there's been religious teachers who teach error? But not only do you know that, Our passage today says that there are some teachers who knowingly are ignorant of the truth so that they can teach falsehood. They know the truth, deny the truth. They're ignorant of truth just so they can teach error. They are willfully ignorant of truth. That fact is not only sad for them, it's dangerous for those who listen to them. Let me show you today. Get your Bible out. Join me, 2 Peter 3. Get something as well to jot down some notes. I mentioned the gospel tract a moment ago. I have a sample packet that I want to give to you, which contains one each of all of our English gospel tracts. And my announcer at the end of the program will tell you how to get one from us. But one of the tracts in it is this one, The Tragedy of a Wasted Life. The Tragedy of a Wasted Life. This gospel tract begins with a testimony, a true testimony, of a man who had experienced the obvious grace and goodness and leading of God, but then he squandered it. He ended up wasting his time, wasting his talents, and wasting his treasure. Oh, believer friend, you and I can know that God's been gracious to us. We can know that God's good to us, but we can end up squandering his goodness and grace. 
squander our time using it for self, not for him, squandering our talents, not being used for the gospel and the furtherance of the truth of God, are you squandering your treasure? Are, are your dollars that you make making a difference for the gospel any place in the world instead of just lining your pockets and for your retirement? God has things to say about every phase of our life. Here's a good track. Not only does it present the gospel, it challenges believers as well about how we're going to live our life. The tragedy of a wasted life. Have pen and paper ready to jot down our contact information. You can just go to our website, which is BibleTracksInc.org. That word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S, BibleTracksInc.org. Well, my Bible is open, 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning of verse 3, the Bible says this, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, that is, died, all things continues as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, God's now commenting now, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Stop right there. Now the five verses here, verses 3 through 7, are a complete section in my outline of the third chapter, and my title for those five verses are this, the word first, F-I-R-S-T, first. The first or the uppermost task of Bible preaching churches is to spot and deal with false teachers. In verses 3 and 4, we saw that false teachers often use ridicule to undermine old-time, well-established Bible doctrine, and that's what we saw on yesterday's broadcast. But today, I want to look at verse 5. My title for verse 5 is the word refusal. We went from ridicule to refusal. What do false teachers refuse to see, refuse to believe? Well, verse 5 begins this way. For this, they willingly are ignorant. The word this here turns us back to verse 4. And in verse 4, two things are talked about. Number one, Jesus' second coming. And number two, the creation story. The false teachers come into churches and they try to teach falsehood about these two key issues, and we need to be able to spot them when we find people that deny these two things. They deny the return of Christ with its judgment on sinners and sin, and they deny that God had a hand, a direct hand, the only hand, in creating the world. But verse 5 says these people are willingly ignorant of this. These words mean that these teachers let obvious truth escape their notice. They willingly or purposely uh, deny and disregard things that can be obviously known. I have and probably you have said something like this and said it as a joke. It goes like this. Well, this is my opinion and don't bother me with the facts. (laughs) Oh, that can be a funny statement and and we can have fun with it when everybody knows that we're joking. But when folk willingly ignore facts, ignore truth, obvious truth, so that they can promote error, that's not just funny. That's not funny. That's dangerous. Now, what do false teachers willingly refuse to believe? Well, number one, as we said, that God judges sin. They refuse to believe that God has ever judged sin and that he will one day have all men stand before him to be judged. All we need to do is go over to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. We find out that he will. But verse 5 goes on with a, another difficult statement to fully deal with. The statement, it begins like this. It says, and I'm quoting now from verse 5, By the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. If you read some commentaries by good and godly teachers on verse 5 here, you're going to find that there are some variants about what some people think that all this is meaning here and in the last part of the verse. For me, here's the obvious things that we can say based upon verse 5. 
first of all, we can say that God intervened in the first place when he spoke and created the world. You see, these false teachers deny that God is going to step in and intervene in the world and judge. Well, God intervened in the first place when by his word, he made the world. By his word, the heavens were of old, the verse says. The Bible teaches that God created our physical world planet, our physical universe, out of absolutely nothing. He didn't start with stuff already in existence. There was nothing in existence. Bible believers who hold to the Genesis of count of creation, we say that the Bible starts with this basic fact. In the beginning, there was nothing except the triune God. And in his wisdom and for his glory, he created our world starting with absolutely nothing. He made it by speaking. Genesis chapter 1 has this phrase, and God said over and over again. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 makes this point as well. But the last part of verse 5 says this, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now, this is the part really where it gets serious for a lot of people and that we cannot be overly dogmatic about as far as some disagreement goes. But for me, I tend to go with the simple and the most obvious explanation. Verse 5 says that God created the world by his spoken words. This last part of verse 5 appears to simply mean that God created the dry land standing out of the water or separated from the water, but the dry land was then located in the water or surrounded by water. Now, this might also, by the way, refer to the fact that at creation, God made a canopy of water above the earth. That canopy is going to be used by God and was used by God at the time of Noah's flood. There is no canopy today. Now, okay, (laughs) there we are. You may be asking yourselves right now, what in the world do I need with this verse? What practical value does this verse have for me today? Let me answer that question. When we sing, this is my father's world, it's not just a good song, it's truth. God made our world. God designed the world and he designed it for his glory, not yours, not mine, his But right now, God is not receiving glory from our world. Sin has brought death and destruction to our world. And the people on the planet, for the most part, live their lives in open rebellion against their creator, God. Now, in light of this, in light of the world was made for God's glory, which he's not getting, in light of the world that people are living in willful rebellion against the God who created them, it ought to be obvious that God must, he must step in and judge the mess that we sinners have made and take charge of creation again. When will all this take place? When can it take place? I don't know, but I do know this. It can start by Mark Smith letting God be king of his life and his heart. Let God be on the throne of my heart and soul. Have you Dear believer friend, have you recently, like in the last few hours, bowed your head and heart and said, God, be king of my life. I crown you now. If you haven't, maybe it's overdue for you to do it again. Without Christ as Savior, you've got the wrong king. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, You can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.